So, so, uh, and the hatred I would get would be from white folks. White folks would be like, oh, you want to be an N-word. You want to be blah, 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 you, blah, you know. White people in Long Island. Yeah, exactly. What, at school? Oh, yeah. Or, or said, said to say, you, you want to be a nigger. All the time. Yeah, that's what that, in that era. Yeah, of course, in the really? 80s. Think about the 80s. And, and N-word that, music. Eh, you know, and that, that fucked you up socially with the white kids at school and in the neighborhood? No, I didn't care about nobody. I thought they were clowns. I'm like, yo, Sure. You ain't shit. <laughs> but you know, they're but, like, but, we don't want to fuck with you. Maybe we was fucking with you before, but we're not fucking with you because you're rolling with them. Well, I, I don't know if it was people that didn't fuck with me before. Fucked with me before. I'm talking okay. about new people that I okay. met. You know, you okay. see, you know, the hatred. He's the come. white guy who likes to hang yeah, out with black and, kids, and, so we're not fucking and with And I them. moved around a lot. So I would end up, I would, it was weird. I'd go to a new school and everybody, oh, that's the rat. They knew who I was before I even, I was like, how the fuck did they even know that? Because your name was. Because there was no internet at the time. There was nothing. And oh, the white, the, the white rapper, the white rapper's here. And, and they would just know, so. The to a ratio. Okay, though. The to a ratio. Okay, though. That might be the best question I've ever been asked. <laughs> You's a phenomenal person. I mean, you legendary. I am a fan of you, my brother. R.A. the Rugged Man is a veteran MC who's been in the rap game for a long time. He's had a crazy life, y'all. I didn't know the half of it, and that has produced a lot of wisdom. He's a super interesting guy. Let's dig into it. It's R.A. the Rugged Man on Tour A Show. So take me back to the beginning. Where did the dream of becoming a rapper even first start? Well, I was in Long Island, and there was Long Island started becoming like the hottest uh, rap in the world. Mm-hmm. Eric B and Rakim. Yeah, Rakim was EPMD. around. EPMD. Exactly. You know it all. De La Soul, all of that stuff. The Strong know. Island. Yeah, yeah. Like... So we were really, and the Bomb Squad, their production, like all, all the Cali production straight out of comp, that came from Bomb Squad. It was right. all Long Island based production. That's why Cube came to, you know, to, to, right. to Long Island to work on his, his solo albums. But but yeah, so there was so much stuff going on. My dad bought me a Fat Boys tape because I was a fat kid. He thought it was funny. He, you know, the the, the eleven cents. Yo, he, wait a minute. That's kind of fucked up that your dad bought you. He because he was making fun yeah, of yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I was a little fat kid. Overweight. Yeah, yeah. So he said, "Yo, I got you." T-. You, you know, when you send away eleven uh, tapes for a penny, of course. So he got at Columbia Records. Yeah, so he got his own music, and then uh, he he saw Fat Boys. So uh, for my son, you know. So he handed me the Fat Boys. Oh yeah, real funny, Dad. So I played it. I liked it. It was cool. They were cool. Yeah, no, no, no. I I, I love the Fat yeah, Boys. Yeah, no, now. Hey, no. I'm but, si- but I, I was I was probably ten, eleven, and my dad's making Fat Boys. So, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, that was my first rap tape. But um, the album that made me fall in love with well, well, I had Houdini Escape, which I loved and I played all the time. Right. But as far as a lyrical thing, uh, there was an album Marley Mall produced MC Shan, and it was Down by Law, and yes. I, I ended up. Memorizing it from front to back. That's yes. when I started getting into lyrics through MC Shan, and then, and then um, the whole Juice crew. And B- Biz Markie was the first celebrity that took me, and I was like about fourteen, and he was on Noble Street in Brentwood, you know, Long Island, and Diamond Shell was getting, you know, all of that. So, um, so Biz would be on the couch like, "Yo, Arbe, you kind of nice with it," you know, like the way he Yo. talks. And, and he was a horror fan too. That's a story I tell. But I used to bring because I had my horror VHS tapes that I tape all these weird things. And he'd be like, do you have this? Do you have that? So, I, so, I, so I'd, I'd bring tapes for Biz, and he'd keep them, you know. <laughs> and we always had that joke, like, yo, Biz, bring my tapes back. He's like, I gave them back to you already, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, so he was the one of the first You're ones. 14, and he's how old? My guess is probably 20-something, yeah. 21. Because he got on early. He was young. Yeah, yeah, he was a teenager. But yeah. I, my, my guess is, is uh, how, old is, how old is Biz? I guess he's probably 10 years older than us. Okay, okay. So, so... so Oh, no, no, eight years old. You know, okay. that, that's the thing is, too. Uh, rappers seem like adults when you're 14. Oh, my God. But they were 19, 18. Yo. Rakim was in high school writing Peyton Full. Yo, LL Cool J is only a little bit older 16, than me. Well, well, but I thought of him as he's a grown man. Yeah. I'm a child compared exactly. to LL. People don't understand that they say, like, 
oh, that guy's a young boy, and he'll be like 25 now or 26. Yeah. As a young, you know, he's got, it's like, yo, Rakim was 17, Cool J was well, 16. No, 16. Cool no, J was one of the best on the planet at 16 years old. Yeah, there's all, no teenagers all, in hip hop yeah. anymore. Not yeah, that not too people many, care yeah. about. Yeah, like, you yeah. got to be a little more grown. Well, you know what that is because it was it was a youth oriented sport, but then yes. what happened, it became a business. Yes. So, what 15, 16, 17, 18 year old really know their business unless they get the right management? But, but, but like, also, like the level of quality mm -hmm. of for an MC to be taken seriously, like, you got to get a little bit older into your 20s to be able to think and write things and they have done it long enough that I care about your quality versus somebody who's just been doing it for a minute. No, well, I, I'm not really, because I don't really, I agree with what you're saying because life experiences as older men we, or, or older people, we like, I want to relate to somebody's life experiences so that's better. But think about dancing. There's like 11, 12, 13 year olds that just got it. And sure. they're going to, they don't need life experience to be like incredible and blow your mind. And that's what kind of hip hop was a performance piece. Absolutely. So that's why all these, you know, the Grandmaster Kaz, all of them was 17, 18, 19. Kumo D, when they were starting, it was, it was teenage kids. Wait, when you were 14 and first coming up, you're rapping, could you be boy? Uh, I, I break I break dance. I had a boom box. I used to bust steps and stuff. But, you could but, DJ? No, I never DJ. DJ? Did I was you DJ. write? I was a dick. No, nope. I was a dancer and a rapper. Okay. I, I, I played with making beats, stuff like that. Okay. But, but we used to have to um, loop the loops on, on little tapes and, and put a finger on it and put it yep. through the thing and, yeah. and, and freestyle. Like, you know, we take like what, Marvin Gaye's sexual heel and yep. put, it on, put it on a pencil, <laughs> let it spin around yep. and we'd all freestyle to that. So stuff like that. But no, no, I, the main thing I got into, it was weird because when I was 11, I got, I, I got into it with my friends. And, and, then I, and then by the time I was 12, 13, I started getting, I was just better than people around me. It was just something natural for some reason. We don't know why, right? So then they started taking me to house parties, like, yo, <laughs> and, and I was just that guy, you know, like, yo, he's the Jump one, on know. the mic. Yeah, so, and, and at the time, you know, I had a high-pitched voice. I was a fat kid, high-pitched voice. 14, and, and yeah. I, well, I was 11 when I started. They, well. they had me in house parties around 13, 14, 15, 16, but um, I'd walk in, the, they all knew who I was in Long Island, and I'd come sure. in the house party, and they knew that, that and, and, you know, and at the time, it, it wasn't like, uh, there was no white faces at the parties. It, right. It was, it was, it was, uh, so they was like, yo, this guy got the nerve to come here. And and, and I would always, uh, and, and also black folks would take in if you respected the craft. Yes. Like people were like, oh, you didn't get shot. Like, shut the, f no, oh, we like to curse? I don't know. He, I don't of know. course, of course. No, of no, course. If, if you. If, Fuck yeah, you yeah, can yeah. curse. Exa oh, yeah, I had no idea. But you know, if you if you respect the culture and you could do it, they, they embraced it. So yeah. anytime I came in the house party, it was all love. So, so, uh, and the hatred I would get would be from white folks. White folks would be like, oh, you want to be an N-word. You want to be blah, 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 you, blah, you know. White people in Long Island. Yeah, exactly. What, at school? Oh, yeah. Or, or said, said to say, you, you want to be a nigger. All the time. Yeah, that's what that, in that era. Yeah, of course, in the really? 80s. Think about the 80s. And, and N-word music. Eh, you know, and that, that fucked you up socially with the white kids at school and in the neighborhood? No, I didn't care about nobody. I thought they were clowns. I'm like, yo, Sure. You ain't shit. But you know, they're but, like, but, we don't want to fuck with you. Maybe we was fucking with you before, but we're not fucking with you because you're rolling with them. Well, I, I don't know if it was people that didn't fuck with me before. Fucked with me before. I'm talking okay. about new people that I okay. met. You know, you okay. see, you know, the hatred. He's would the come. white guy who likes to hang yeah, out black and, kids. And, so we're not fucking. And with I them. moved around a lot, so I would end up. I would. I, it was weird. I'd go to a new school and everybody. Oh, that's the rat. They knew who I was before I even. I was like, how the fuck did they even know that? Because your name. Because there was no internet at the time. There was nothing. And it, oh, the white, the but the white rapper, the white rap is here, and, and they would just know. So uh, maybe you know, I well, I, you know, the hat sideways, boom, box, maybe that helped. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was real corny with it. I. Uh, uh, I, I got the Flavor Flav clock. I would rock that in the hallways. Nobody nice. was <laughs> like, yo, he's crazy too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Who the fuck wears a Flavor Flav clock to high school? So wait, so so, <laughs> so so you're giving me a vision of what's going on in the parties, in the streets, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. coming up. I'm guessing that your home life was hard. Yeah, yeah, we had a, my home life was extremely hard, yeah, yeah. Like, like what was going, like you lost well, a brother. Yeah, I, I, my I, sister I, died, my, my brother died. Well, at the time they weren't dead yet. But um, my father was a Vietnam veteran, you know, PTSD, all that stuff. He was ups and downs. And, and, and was he violent? Did he hit you? No, he never hit me. No, no. He, well, you know, he was he was uh, a disciplinary. You know, yeah. he'd take me in the bathroom. You know, hey, hey, if you weren't behaving, you know, you know that that kind of stuff. That was normal at the time. Absolutely. He wasn't. He wasn't a he violent would, where he would close fist and break my. Fist. He okay, wasn't that kind okay, of okay, violent. Okay. He was the spank you. Rip your ear off, hey boy, come here, type of guy. So then, yeah, and and he was the normal. type of guy that would would 
flex his authority. And, and you knew like when daddy said it, yo, you scared, you know? But it was never the scare where I'm like, yo, he's gonna break my body parts. That, okay. He wasn't okay. abusive. He okay. was just a guy from the, you know, born 46. So, you know, in the 50s, you know, that was, that was, you know. Yeah. So it wasn't like, yeah. So. Yeah. And, and, and but, but he was violent in the streets, you know, he, he had guns everywhere. He was fighting in the streets, getting locked up all the time, all of that stuff. And, and then the last 25 years of, his, years of his life, he was calm, cool, this and that. But, oh, okay, so what you were saying with the kids, my sister Didi was born. She couldn't walk or talk because of Agent Orange. The government sprayed it in Vietnam. And then um, he said, oh, it's a one in a million, one in a million. We didn't know it was Agent Orange or what it was. We just had a handicapped kid in the family. And then my, my, uh, my brother was born, and he couldn't walk or talk, and he was blind. So oh, one in a million, you know what I mean? Agent Orange. And, and my older sister, Lily, who, who, who she was born totally fine. She's my older sister. Me and her were born fine. The third kid was the first handicapped one. And they said, uh, uh, she's fine, right? But then she had a baby, and that died at six months old. So it didn't just kill my dad's kids, it killed his grandchild. And we, and it's in our DNA, it's in our genetics. Like we don't know, we'll, like our kid, like great grandkid. So we don't know how long Agent Orange stays in our fucking DNA, but they fucked up our genetics. Like they, the government sprays the shit on their people and your genetics is fucked up when you're killing your grandchildren, you know? So wait, are you, you have two kids. I have to, well, yeah, and that was good? the- good? Yeah, they're totally fucking beautiful and amazing. And that, yo, like I was having nightmare. I was thinking like, and not even just like, you know, like I- You were I, afraid that you yeah, were gonna course, have that course, for your kids. Of course, of course, and, and I have the mother of my children, she's like this beautiful, educated school teacher, and I'm a trashy guy, you know, and I got, <laughs> I got a nice woman, she's, she's, she's educated as much, but she reads all day, and um, I'm like, yo, imagine, that, you know, like I can handle it, but imagine I get this woman where, think about it, my sister, we had to change the diapers for 26 years, a grown woman, you know what I mean? And let, pick her up and put her in the tub. 26 years, and my stepmother and my father had to, you know, take care of this grown-sized woman every day and carry up the stairs, whatever it was, feed her. So I'm like, like, yo, like, imagine if I put this burden on this woman. I, I would love the child. Sure. But, uh, uh, so yeah, that, that's going through my head. And, and then because the kids were dead, I, 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 um, I used to, like, when my daughter was born healthy, yo, I would used to wake up like, like like she got, like she'd breathe and, and I'd scare the shit out of them. Like, yo, you gotta stop doing this to me. I'm like, yo, I'm so sorry, I'll sleep in another room. But like anytime my daughter would make noises and I would like, I would, is she okay? And she'd be like, yo, she's fucking hiccuped. What the fuck is wrong with you? I'm like, yo, I'm sorry. Cause we, you know, three dead. And, and it just felt too good to me that I have this beautiful, perfect baby. I'm like, there's gotta be something more to that, they, like like that bullshit was going through my head. But after a year, year and a half of every, and then my son being born, everyone's healthy. I, I no, my kids are great. They're fine. They're fine. I don't have that panic no more. But but it was it was wild. You know, uh, a, a lot of parents go through that. I mean, it's definitely uh, uh you know related to your personal trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I definitely remember my wife too being like, "Is baby okay? Yeah, She's yeah, fine. It's fine. Yeah, you did that. Now imagine like a psycho version of what you would do. I was like, ah, ah. <laughs> Like, 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 almost like Vietnam. No, shit is real. <laughs> it was crazy. Shit is real. She was like, you're a maniac, chill. <laughs> so wait, so wait, so a lot of people really, what stands out for you, for a lot of people, is the way you rhyme, the the speed when you go really fast. I could do slow, too. I no, got lyrical course. stuff, too, but yeah, yeah, of yeah. Of course. Yeah. But how did that part of your arsenal develop? How did you perfect that ability to go, you know, 16 really fast? Well, you know, I, I came from... I was in the 80s with those guys, but 80s had a lot of st style stuff as well. You know, biz was style, you know? Sure. And, and then you go like Buster, he was Long Island too, style, style, yeah. and, and a fast flow flaunting. And then, and then you know, the Trini, uh, my, my man from Brooklyn, uh, Chip Fu, he would come in and yeah. And then, um, and I love doing it. So I do it on a record here and there, but I wouldn't do a whole record like that. You know, I'd do little, you know, little flips. You know, like I could do a little of that. And then, um, and then the new era came in where it was like the Rakim babies came in, Nas, Raekwon, you know, everybody serious on the mic again. Like we were after Rakim a little bit, it was a little fun, you know, like I said, Slick Rick, Rick and Spe Chub Rock, you know, sure. Slick, Slick Rick was doing that fast stuff too. Yeah, exactly. Even Super Lover C, I don't know if you remember who he Hell was, yeah. he was Queens. He came out to the show in Charlotte and he has a song called Pump It Back. And he, it's the first time I ever heard a double time flow. I said, where did you get that from or did you originate that? Because I haven't never, and, and, and don't mark my words that it's the first because if someone can name a record before it, I'm all ears, sure. you know, because I'm a historian. I'm not sure. 
But I said, he said, nah, I, I came up with that when I did it. I just did it. So it's possible that a double time flow was before that. But Pump It Back was a song where he was, and, and, and I was like, whoa, what the, f that's a bugged out flow. And then years later, double time became like a normal thing that everyone kind of does here or there. Even, even the slow rappers will do some double time stuff. So. So, so I remember that. So I was, I was kind of, yeah, Chub Rock. I liked all that. Like Chub Rock had style, you know, like you are a blabber. And he do, he, it was more comedic and fun. And I liked yeah. that era of hip hop. Pooba. I liked that mm -hmm. era of, of hip hop. I love the serious, uh, you know, Mob Deep, you know, uh, uh, painting a picture out the projects. Too. X Clan was, was great doing too. that same sort of. But yeah, X Clan. Uh, see, they were they were pro black, militant, rhyming, but Brother melody. Jay still had the melody yes. and the vocal tones, and yes. he he. He was like a new school version of the old school. Sure. He was doing the Curtis Blow and the Melly Mel's with his voice. Sure. But he was updating it with like lyrical content sure. that wasn't really, you know, yeah. Brother Jay, I think, has one of the greatest voices ever, in, in my opinion. Hell like, yeah. yeah. You know, Hell and yeah. He's, he's slept on, yeah. I, I think people from, you know, once 93, 94, 95, when, when like lyrical hip hop became commercial, like, you know, uh, uh, Nas, Biggie, Pun, Tupac, you know, I think a lot of the stuff, and a lot of people grew up just learning hip hop then. I think a lot of stuff from before that is just kind of written off, like they, they act like it didn't exist a lot of people. Well, it's an interesting point you make. The 90s, it became a little more career oriented, yeah, 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 yeah. album oriented, mm -hmm. people thinking about how can I do this for a while, make a video, do a tour, right? Yep. And it was a lot more money, too. There was more, but to probably because there's more money in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 80s, a lot of them weren't really thinking about a career. Their careers were they shorter. Know, they didn't know that there could be a career. Right. Oh, Rock yeah. Kim is really four albums. Yeah, it's yeah. not that much, yeah, right? But, we, but, but it's not, you got to look at, you know, the time, you know, context of the times. Yeah. Because I hate when people do that. Now, you're not doing it, but they'll be like, this guy has 17 albums and that guy from the 80s that you like only has three. But it's, they don't understand there was no internet. You couldn't put out your own albums. You couldn't get in a studio. You didn't have budgets. It was a different era. You didn't have that era. kind of money. You there didn't was, have that kind of experience. I mean, I know KRS did a lot of albums. EPMD did a lot of albums. A lot of those guys, you know, P. Yeah, but EPMD but the, and their prime only did four, it, you know, back yeah. to back. But like, it is, it is when we talk about all-time top fives, more. it is tricky, or top 10, whatever. It is tricky because the 80s, the thought was short. There's, everybody's careers were shorter. Then you get in the nineties and double O's, and I don't want to. Yeah, because when money's involved, you could keep your career. Uh, you could keep going a lot longer. And in the eighties, the record labels dominated everything. Yeah. So if you wanted to try something a little, they wouldn't let you do it. They wouldn't finance that project. They wouldn't say, "Yeah, let's do videos for this song that's really different that no one will understand." We got to stay on top of what's. And it was also youth oriented sport, like I said. So they'll go like. Yeah, we got him from 17 to 20. Well, who's the next 17, 18 year old? Who's the next? It was, a, and the record labels, you couldn't just be like, now I'm going to throw my music online and everyone could come to it and listen to it. It, wasn't, it was too, I think the, the core consumer in the 80s, as far as the industry thought, who's buying this, was a young black man in the inner city. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And then and, early and, and black 90s, girls too, a lot, you know, but hip hop absolutely. Was, was, you know. The, there was it, a lot of black girls in the parties back then. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't like now. You go to a rap show. Something. It's a bunch of dudes. Like yeah. yeah. <laughs> not not but, all rap shows. But in but, the yeah. '90s, it became the suburban white True. boy. Definitely, 100. percent And that 100%. shifted so many things in terms of how we present, who gets mm -hmm. what songs get pushed, and yep, like, it changes so much. Well, that's what I, I always said. That I said because before that, you had the uh, Karis ones, the Rock Kims, and these guys that hip hop community knew, and you weren't like, what numbers are they doing? How, what's their first week sales, you know? No, no, yeah. And then somewhere down the line, it, it's like almost like hip hop and Backstreet Boys fans and Britney fans have to be the same fucking fan base. And like, who did, he only did 800,000 the first week, he did 200. It's like, yo, nobody cares. It's, if you're doing music for culture, it's supposed to be about that. But then, you know, when, all, when, when it becomes a multi-billion dollar, $100 billion a year industry, maybe even more, I don't even know how much, but, yeah, it, it turns into something that's not what it was. You know, it turns into like you have to market to old ladies that don't, you know, casuals, this, that. It's it's not a. You see yourself as underground. Is that like, like, is that like, this is what I want to be? This is where I want to be? Because people who don't know would say, well, you're underground because you haven't made a hit. Yeah, and yeah. you would love to be pop. And I don't know, you might be like, no, 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 I don't want to be pop. I want to be here. No, well, the thing is, I may, I may in my mind, and to, to a lot of my fans, I, I have a lot of hits. Yeah. But 
um, I don't have a, a, a big budget to push it to a more extreme audience, you know? So, so you know, everybody wants to say, I, I make music for as many people as I as possible to hear the music I make, but the difference is I won't. I don't want to change my music to get a certain demographic or a certain bunch of people. I just want to make whatever the fuck I want to make. And if if uh, if I have no marketing budget and all it is like like my last album, we, we was charting on Billboard. We we was number three in the UK on the pop albums. We did great on it. I mean the the the, the pop charts. I think the album went twenty two with no and, and all it is is me on Facebook. And Twitter and IG and, you know, making videos myself, putting them on YouTube. We like, we literally have no campaign. Like when my shit drops, it's just us, you know, and me going, oh, let's do a live stream. Hey, we're having an online party. The album's out. That's all it is. You know, so if we had, you know, a, a big money back and of course more people get to hear it, that, that is what it is. But the flip side of when you do it this way, it's also like you could do whatever you want, whatever time, whatever, it doesn't matter. You could get this person on the album, you could get that beat from this, you could try this type of style. And uh, and also, if you're not making this big, oh, it's gotta be the first week splash. Uh, not a lot of people know this song, we could do a video for it three years later, throw it out there, and then millions of people see the video and they go, oh, great new song. It's like, well, it's a little older, but it's, it's, new, to it's new to a lot of people that haven't heard it. So. So it is ups and downs, you know. Ups I mean, and downs. your 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 flow is really great, and your 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 just rhythmic approach to the track. So, and that to me is like the most important thing for an MC, right? So, how much of that is what you write, and how much of that is your rhythmic sense in taking the words that you have and fitting them into the space? Well, it's it, it works both ways. Sometimes you'll get a beat. And the beat just rhythmically puts your flow on. Like, you don't even got to work. You're like, oh, the flow's this beat for some reason. I got 500 flows, like, in my, I don't even got to try. So sometimes a beat will do that. But sometimes you'll be sitting on a train, uh, train or a plane and you'll be like, oh, I got this great idea for a verse. And you start writing it. And then you go, let me find a beat that this rhyme fits to and make sure that I can make the flow sound really good with these bars. So, you know, there's different ways to do it, you know. I mean, sometimes when you're writing like internal rhymes, especially, I'm like, so, because sometimes you'll, you know, you guys, so here's a polysyllabic rhyme, here's monosyllabic rhymes, or well, I'm, here I'm doing one words. So are you thinking of the flow as you're writing it, or you apply that after? No, no. Oh, like I said, it depends. Like sometimes I just want to get the words out and that's like usually the one on the plane. Like I got a good song here. I know it in my head. I got the good song. Let me get it out on the paper. Yeah. I'll worry about the flow later, you know, and I find the right song. How, what, what will make this rhyme sound really good? And then, yeah, you could be like, oh, take a couple syllables out, change, change the rhyme here, make it fit a little better. Boom, boom, boom. But a lot of times, like I said, the beat just comes out. And, and I guess that is what you're asking. It's like, the flow will just be there, and I know the flow already. So, I'm like, yeah, let's fit some, 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 fit the words real into good the... lyricism into that flow. Rather, but, and you don't want to give any throwaway words that, like, you know, that's ordinary. That's the flow is so good, so it should be good enough. But no, you don't want to do that. You still want to, even if it's an intricate, cool flow, you want to say something that's interesting or said differently. So it's not like, oh, he's flowing. Because a lot of people, you know, because that's like technical. Anybody can, not anybody can't, anybody, but a lot of rappers are super technical. But now are they saying stuff on that super technical rhyme style, you know? So you have to, you got to give them a little bit of both. Sometimes you could have fun and just roll around and, you know, here's a bounce. But you want to kind of give them something interesting. And I'm not saying super lyrical either. Sometimes, like Heavy D, he, you know, he, he would just say some fun, wild shit, bounce on the track, and it sounded amazing. Yeah. But it wasn't like he wasn't coming with like Chuck D rhymes or, I mean, or, or we, we uh, Reagan was the pres. But I voted, voted for Shirley Chisholm. Chisholm. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, like yeah. it's just a dope line. It's There's nothing the ever. special yeah. that you. Know, but like the way he says it, yeah, 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 and yeah. it just it just sticks in the mind. And yeah, Biz is one of my favorite MCs of all time. Hell yeah, it really man. is. And, and I know people, you know, they know him as the the just a friend guy stuff. But like when those singles were coming out, and Molly Ma was dropping those songs with Biz, it was just like. You never heard no MC. It was just so perfect. It was like rap perfection to me. And I know people go, well, I need a little bit more intricate bar. But 
Yo, when he did Nobody Beats Yeah, the one Biz, of the best songs ever made. Right? And he's just cutting through that track. Like, he yeah. was not like a clown. Like, he was like, he was a, yeah, I'm serious. M and like, yeah, yo, yeah. that song destroyed New York you know for a bit. crazy? Nobody knows. Like, no, not, not enough people go back. Like, I just had an, not an argument, but like a Twitter thing where like, they were dissing Jay-Z how they always do because mm. he quotes Biggie too much, right? Ugh. And the one thing uh, was like, <clears throat> I oh, hate that critique. They said he stole this rhyme from from J, uh, Biggie too, and it was like, ha, 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 check out this bizarre style used by me, the B. Yeah. I'm like, no, Biz. He's quoting him. Biz, uh, Big quoted Biz. So you're critiquing <laughs> Jay for doing what Big did on that track, but they're too stupid to even know, or, or just don't know enough to know that that's not even Jay-Z, uh, Biggie's rhyme, you right. know? So, but there's a lot of that. And then, and, then, and then if you go back, you listen to every MC ever, and everybody got quotables from a, a song that they liked in the past. Everybody. It don't matter if it's Method Man, Funky Dope, Maneuver, whatever, whatever. Right. We, we all, they all did it. So j it, just, just to take Jay-Z and go, Jay-Z's the one that bites everybody. No. You know, uh, no, and, no. And, and I like Jay. I'm not one of the, the Jay-Z's the GOAT guy either. I'm not like, I must defend Jay-Z, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm not that guy. Wait, who is your GOAT? It or, depends. Or your top five. It depends which, you know, category you go. But, but one of the beefs that we had on, on that damn Twitter app was, uh, was I said, Coogee Rap would destroy Jay-Z any day of the week. Easy. And, and everyone's like, he's so stupid, ignorant. You know, in a and, battle? In anything. Lyricism, you know, all of that. But, but you know, I, I know the catalog, no. they'll say Jay. But I, I think if you put Jay and Coogee Rap on any song together, any song, I mean, Jay-Z wouldn't stand a chance. That, that's my opinion. I, I think he would get bodied 10 times out of 10. Like G-Rap. I mean, like, yeah. I remember G-Rap. Today, in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 20, it don't matter what I, decade. I don't agree with you. Yeah, I know. A lot of people don't. I, but I, mean, I've, I don't, I will not dismiss the point yeah, yeah. because I remember how great G-Rap was. And in a way, he does predate Jay in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm real. I'm just in the studio just to show you this other thing that I do, but I'm real outright. Like that's kind of Jay Z's. I mean, G, G, G Rap was '86. People, people don't understand. He was, he was, he was when Rakim was changing, yeah. changing the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They thought about each other. He, they thought so, about so, each other. So yeah. uh, I mean, decade after decade, and and then when Nas just came off of Illmatic, they did Fast Life together, and G Rap wrecked Nas. Like it's like he's just the Mob Deep was the biggest group, and they did that that joint on the Alchemist beat, and G Rap just shined so like. He, he's always that guy, you know. I I I mean, it's interesting because I do, I do continue to find myself impressed by Jay Z. Oh, you, I'm not. It, it's like, hey, and listen, I know you're not hating. I know yeah, you're not hating. Because you know, LeBron, the first thing if you critique or say anyone's better than Jay, the whole world says you're a hater, hater, hater. Well, well I love Jay, and and I honestly, I know Jay from the Hawaiian Sophie's days, the first, first video ever. I know him when he was on Jazz's albums, I, and I like, I see people dissing his rhymes on those, and I think they're dope too. Yeah. And and, and uh, original no, flavor. Just, uh, I mean, uh, we have a culture of. It's either dope or whack. Yeah. And it's like, no, no, no. I'm not saying he's whack. I'm just saying this other MC is better. But that yeah. don't mean he's you whack. Know, Jay has outstanding songs and music and catalog and rhymes. So uh, for anyone. So wait, who is so, so you, so I said, give me top five. And you were like, well, what's the well, category? I, you want I, yeah, me to narrow I, it? Yeah, because I don't have a top five. And plus it changes, you know, by, by you know. Do you have top five flows? Yeah, but like, but, like, 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 oh, like, not just a song, but like the way guys flowed for their career, because that to me is the number one thing uh, for for my my sonic relationship with MC. How do you flow? And if your flow is dope, I can listen to the song a million times, figure out what you're saying. Yeah. Well, well, if you go with the flow route, you know, there's guys like you know. Uh, uh, Buster Rhymes, of course, has a Method Man has of a ridiculous flow. And even if you want to go underground, Tech Nine, uh, technical flows, you know, there's flows. So, so if you go for flows, and we said Chip Fu from Foosh Nick and Yo, Chub Rock, those guys had Pooba. Pooba has one of my favorite yeah. flows of all time, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, but I don't know, although the, those the GOAT flows, those are my favorite flows. But also, I'm. I, when you were saying, yeah, a lot of people don't have catalogs because records in the 80s wasn't happening, that's another thing. I was a kid in the 80s, and it was all about going to the party, going to rock the house, going to that. So it was always, to me, like performance. And I think a lot of times people go, oh, he's got better recorded songs, so he's the better MC. 
But, yes. uh, but but I'm sometimes I, th- that's why I rate like Big Daddy Kane so high because it's like four decades of when he goes on stage, Big Daddy Kane will obliterate the performance and and flawless. You know, like he sounds like the record, flawless. Like how does how does how does a man do it? So so like Kane live, it, as much as I love G Rap as the lyrical guy, Kane live is that guy. You know. And and then you could go even for for, for fun MCs like I, I was naming like my favorite live performers the other day and and if you ever saw like Nice and Smooth which those guys aren't lyrical like that they they do the fun hey, Jay Gillespie play the, the sax. sax people be like that but but if you see Greg Nice he's from the Bronx from you know from my the, life's the, like the, a the fairy early tale days. and when you see like one time he was rocking the Apollo I forgot who else was performing maybe it was Biz maybe Special Ed it was like a a throwback thing. And the equipment messed up and the things wasn't working. And he just emceed it. He st- started hopping on the Apollo seats and had the whole crowd going cr- And it was like emceeing. Dougie Fresh is another ridiculously great MC, which World's people, greatest entertainer. World's greatest entertainer. And people don't bring up those at, those parts of emceeing, you know? So I, there, was I, a big, there was a big difference in that period you're talking about. Some guys would stand on a stage with 30 guys behind them, like the whole hood behind me, and just stand there and shout their rhymes at you. And some people- that was more 90s. The the 80s, you know, Rakim started doing the big entourage on stage and he'd do the walk back and forth thing. But I think the the, the everybody screaming on the stage with with a bunch of guys was was more of a 90s thing. Okay. And I think, and you could say, tell me if I'm wrong, this is just from my memory. So, you know, and I've been traveling all day. So, but but (laughs) I remember, I think in the 80s, MC live showmanship, because we said it wasn't all records yet. You know, you really. Yes. I think the majority of MCs in that era, because it was the closest time to the to the you know the raw you know uncut you know yes. when, when before the corporations got involved, yes. you went to party rocking, and you had to be one of the best at the party. So the majority of MCs at the time in the '80s, like the early '80s to, to late '80s. Most of all of them really could rock a party really good. And still today, a lot of them could really still rock the party good. But I think a lot of the times in the 90s, you had a big record on the radio and you come in there with your boy screaming into the microphone, yo, I'm the best, I'm the, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and they go, yo, they're killing it because the beat that they know from the radio's on and they're not really not party rocking. They're not rocking well, it like in the, that. Well, in the 90s and beyond, you saw And more, that's not all 90s MCs. No, no, no we're not yeah, dissing yeah. the whole generation. Yeah, yeah, of course, because Red and Meth, Farrell Monster, Incredible. all of them, in, well, Farrell Incredible. from the 80s. And, but, yeah. but you started seeing more guys who had a hit and then performed for the first time. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And had yeah. never really been in front of people yep, yep. because he had been in the basement and then in the yep, studio. Yep, 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 it's true. It's true. Well, now it's even more so because you get, you get a, a YouTube video or, mm. or a Spotify hit and you really don't know how to perform. That's why they complain about a lot of them rapping over their own song and stuff like that. And you're like, come on, guys. But different eras, you know, You know, I hate doing the thing where I do the my era is better than me. I was telling somebody just the other day, I was like, yo, because, uh, and I believe it but from the bottom of my heart, you know, that I believe the 80s are better than the 90s. Most people say the 90s are better than the 80s, but that's just, the, you know. You, you know the, the 80s no, ahead my, my of the 90s though? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 way higher to me. Me, but I know a lot of people would be. He's crazy. He doesn't. Okay. I'm not saying crazy, but but, but but I mean, if I got the '90s, I got the I got some of the best of Jay. I got some of the best of Nas. Maybe the best of Nas. I got. I got what I got. Yeah, I got but, later. I got later. Public Enemy. Yeah, but that's yeah, incredible. But but everything you're naming has already been done in the '80s. You know, it's another, you take it to another level, but they're-, they're, they're Nas, re- I mean, I understand, Nas, you said Nas, the son of Rakim. They're redoing what's already been done, where Rakim, when he came like that, they, these guys were really originated. Oh, a pioneer. It, it was the rawest of raw. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not taking nothing away from them. So that that's just part of my argument, is like there were so many styles being originated and, 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 and just perfected to a degree. And then I think those people were students of that. I think in the 80s, sure. it, it moved so quick. Uh, oh, no, but the point I was making was, uh, uh, you know, uh, to be that guy, my era is better, my era is better guy. Do you remember when we were kids? Because I don't want to be Don Cornelius, man. Do you remember when we were kids at Soul Train? Yeah. And 
new edition would go on there, and he just acted like they, they're not Stevie Wonder, they're not Al Green. He's, you know, you could oh, tell yeah, he, he yeah. would never say it, but yeah. he would look down to the artists we loved. Yeah, Rock Kim would be there, and he'd be like, "Who's this guy talking?" Well, he didn't. He, he, Don he Cornelius didn't understand. He hip-hop. wouldn't say, but that's what I'm saying. Wait, so, so I don't want to be that guy. No, you're not. You're not. No, no, no. But that is what it is. If you're like that generation, is no, you're not <laughs> dissing them, but you prefer the eighty. But even in the '90s, I got. I got Snoop. You have to Google it. Well, I don't. Well, it's a long <laughs> ass time ago. I'm just kidding. I, you know, I got, I got meth and big and everyone you name and know. I, I, I pun would, and you love all these, but of course well, you're pun, not. Pun. I, I take. I, I put G rap. Did that before pun. You know, uh, but, but, Rakim did it before Nas. But K- that don't K- mean Kares, they don't really. K- Kares one could kill Snoop. You know, like like I, I just rate the eighties. I don't know. Public Chris enemy could kill. Oh, Snoop. It wouldn't and be I love close. Chris. That wouldn't even be close. I love Come on. Chris. I love Snoop to death. I love his record. I love his voice. I love Snoop. You're talking a battle? Just emceeing, period. Snoop ain't putting on a show Snoop like Chris. Better. And Snoop ain't having lyric, lyricism like Chris either. Uh, Snoop don't have the lyricism. As, as, as what? Kip, no, not even close. What? Not even close. No, what? I, don't know. I got Lauren disagree. Hill. I got Jizza. Yeah, I put Queen Latifah above Lauren Hill by a lot. You know, I think oh, Queen well, Latifah is the rawest form of, of a female MC and, and MC Light as well. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Even yo, Shah Rock came out to uh, to my show in Florida, man. MC Shah Rock, the first female MC of all time. That was mm-hmm. great. Yo, you know how many people are gonna hate on me for this conversation no, because no. they're gonna make that old. They're gonna, you know what they do too when you have an opinion that they don't agree with, they make you even older. They're gonna be like that sixty year old man, <laughs> that old man. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's these are, but these are the arguments everyone has. So you you, know? you got a lot of attention for Uncommon Valor, mm-hmm. your song about your dad. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it's an incredible verse. I mean, it's visual, it's detailed, it's a character, it's real, and you're telling me a real story. And as you're saying, it's really a fundamental story in your life. Mm-hmm. Talk about writing that song. And like your dad was still here when you. Wrote- yeah, he was alive. He he actually when the song came out, he drive around his car playing it like, yeah. and, and and you know we played it at his funeral too, so that was good. Too. So he yeah. didn't see it as critical of him. No, he loved it. He loved it. Did yeah. you see it as critical of him? Well, no, because that's who my father was. He yeah. he was that guy at first. You know, he, he was seventeen years old. Uh, he was a street kid. You know, his, his, his mother left him. He's two. His, his father left him at six to put him, you know, and he's in the streets running around, didn't graduate 11, 11 years old. He was out of school, running around, robbery, all of that shit. And he's stealing cars, got in trouble. And they said, go to the military, kid, you know, and 17 years old. Uh, and then they they program you be, to be a killer. You know, that's what yeah. Paul said. They said, they, they take a kid, they, here's your guns, here's your weapons, here's how you kill, and that's what they do. So my father was a killer. He was a murderer. Yeah, well, not murder. Don't take no, that no. back. Yes. But, but they train you to be a killer. And he used to say, like, you know, the, the Army spends all this time training you to kill, but they never give you that six-month class how not to be a killer when, <laughs> when you go back and they just throw you into society. Hey, don't be a killer. You know, but so... Uh, and and they get you know they gave him a weapon. His gun shot four thousand bullets a minute, like I say in, in in the song. And they say, well, we, you got we got some soldiers on enemy territory. There's a secret mission. You have to get these guys out of there. Uh, the Vietnamese are gonna kill them and torture them. You have to get them. So oh, we got to save our American guys. And you go in there with a gun that could chop down a tree. Four thousand bullets a minute could ch- chop down a fucking tree. And you know you you you're killing. And I used to, when I was a kid, you know, and then you go, oh, I'm saving my guys. And so I used to say as a kid, I said, Dad, how many guys you killed in life? You know, I was a kid. And he said, Dad, uh, you know, he, he'd always try, son, you know, I, I look at it like I didn't take lives. I, t- I tried to save lives, you know. So he never gave me enough. <laughs> you know, but, but so, so you know, and he, he told me the brutal stories some of the other guys would do in the, in the village. And, you know, and, and they'd, they'd be a village elephant and they'd kill the elephant. You know, my, my father said, hey, I, I never got that. Like, what's the point? But like these these gung-ho, you know, they would take the teeth and all this stuff. Like, they, they, he said they were really doing that stuff. And he's like, what's the point of that? But he's, and it, it, like I said in the song too, he said when he first got there, before the before the horrors and the, and the wars and the killing, uh, he said, yo, it was gambling, women, liquor, music. He's like, it was like a party. <laughs> he's yeah. like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm a kid from the streets. Uh, what's it, not alphabets, uh, um, Let's say uh, it's, they make movies, uh, uh, Hell's Kitchen area, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. back in the 50s and stuff and, and 60s. And, and um, you know, you go in the streets, you know, your family ain't accepted, you're taking you in and, and all of a sudden you're, the, you know, 
women and, and booze and, 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 you know, macho, you know. And so he said it was like a party at first, you know. So he's like, a lot of guys go, hey, hey, the trauma. He's like, a lot of you guys didn't even see action and just got laid a lot, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> And then you come home like, oh, I had a hard time. Yeah. Did you? That's That was my father's perspective. So, you of know, course. Yeah. Did you have to interview your father or talk to him to get some of the details? Or did you already know these stories? That's funny. That's funny you asked that. But no, no, I knew the stories basically. But when I wrote the verse, I did. I called up my father. I said, hey, you know, so he said, the, you know, they used to say yellow men wearing black pajamas. So boom, it's right in the yellow men wearing black pajamas. They want to harm us. So a lot of that stuff. And he said the Huey Chopper, that was the gunship. So I was like, like, like a reporter. So I was taking what, what, what's the helicopter? What's the gun? What's this? What's that? And then I called. Uh, Did you tell him what you were doing? Yeah, yeah. I said I'm working on this verse. He said, "All right, son. You know, whatever. Let's see what I'm you're doing." Dude, Dad, I'm doing a verse about you in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no problem. Yeah, yeah. So then I called my stepmother. You know, she was up. My mother. She, she's like my mother. She's still alive. My mother. Both. I got two mothers. My stepmother raised me since I'm four. My mother raised me since I'm born. So my stepmother, I call her up. I say, "Hey, working on a song. I need to know more about what were the exact conditions that that the kids have. You know." So, uh, or had, I can't remember. They were alive at dead. No, they, they were both dead already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what conditions? And she said, oh, yeah, the, the blindness was cortical blindness. Dee Dee was microcephalic. Her head's too small. She had cerebral palsy. So she was telling me all the stuff. So that's why all that stuff, you know, it was like doing a report. Yeah. And then I just wrote it into a rhyme. And that's why I think that's why it resonated with a lot of people because it was, it was you know, well-researched too. It's a know? story, but it's real. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of two of the things we love from rappers, when you tell a story, we've gotten away from telling stories, right? We used to have a lot of stories, 80s, 90s, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. getting away from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it's real. But also being critical of America and American institutions, which is so fucking hip hop. We love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it ticks, it ticks a lot. It ticks a lot of... Yeah, um, but that's why it's so funny when you like say anti-American stuff and they, they act like, oh, remember when you were against the system? Now, now you're saying talking points for CNBC or something you're like <laughs> when was hip hop not anti fucking American you're like you know what the fuck are you of talking course. about you know and one time I did I did a record with with a mortal technique and I had a bandana and, and it was around I, th I think oh, I don't know if it was the same time but Trump had said he thinks if you burn a flag it should fucking do a year in prison do you remember that do you remember something that something like that no, it was real he he said I think they should do a year in prison if anybody burns our flag yeah. so a fucking fuck that shit. Burn a flag and and so the oh you're just going for the system, not against the system. Like, yo, the United States of America is the biggest system there is, you motherfuckers. And I mean, you're talking to me, a guy who 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 the government, you know, personally murdered half of my family. Yeah. So if they're so ignorant, they can't even see that. You know, yeah. it's like. Did anybody talk about filing a lawsuit? Well, here's the thing: is the military, you know, they're smart. And my father was was struggled. He was broke, you know, and uh, um, you know he did check by check. They, he, he had an injury, so when 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 his helicopter got shot down, his leg went like this. He spent 11, uh, 10 months in a body cast, and one leg was shorter than the other. So he was five eleven and a half, and then five eight on the other foot. So um, he, I don't know why I was saying that, but oh oh, he, he didn't. He, so he got a check monthly monthly check from the government, but really small, you know, and. Uh, and they said, hey, listen, you know, you were in six different locations that we sprayed Agent Orange that we know of. Yeah. Six documented, Jesus. so it's probably more than that. Yeah. You know? And uh, these are six that they admitted to, you know. Jesus. So they said, what we'll do is we'll give you uh, uh, 20, we're going to give you $2,200 a year for the next four years. And my dad, oh, shit, hell yeah, $2,200. So literally, That's they, nothing. they gave me $8,800 total for, for, for them. But he had no idea what was coming as far as his No, he knew kids the kids were sick and everything, but all of a sudden, he's like, you know, he came home, hey, I got pizza, Dunkin', Dunkin'. hey, kids, Chinese food, hey, hey, you know, government check came, $2,200. <laughs> they bought him for cheap. Yeah, so yeah they bought him for cheap, you know. But, you know, he, and, and, and he also had the, uh, the soldier mentality. Where you're a strong man, you know. So you know he he uh, it wasn't where like, oh look what the government did to me for him. I'm that way. <laughs> look yeah. what the government did to us. Yeah. But he would say, hey, I signed up for it. I I, I was fighting. You, you know, didn't I, know. You were I a knew. kid. You didn't know. Of course he was. But he he my father had this thing where um, he always wanted to put a positive spin on everything. This is the last 25 years of his life. The first wild out years, I, you know, he was going crazy. I right. He flipped out 
cops come, he breaks some shit up in a, in a laundry mat, whatever. <laughs> he, he was just wild. But but then when he was calm, he said he was, just always had these positive spin on everything. So like he even put a positive spin on that. Like, yeah, yeah, I knew what I was, you know, boom, boom. You know, I, I, I'm a soldier. I, I, you know, I knew I could lose my life. And I'm like, but did you know they could fucking destroy your children and your grandchildren? You know, yeah, I never said that. But that's what I was thinking in my head. But that, that's how he was. He put the positive. Hey, and he said the children, you know, they say it's Agent Orange. There's an interview I have where he said, they say it's Agent Orange, but I say God because they, they're surrounded by love and my children are surrounded by love and all of this type of shit. That's the shit he would say, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm fucking weird. Kid, but I hear, right? <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. So wait, so, so you've been in a studio with a lot of incredible, incredible dudes. Who impressed you the most? Who came in and was like, and just destroyed the that's booth. How, that's how you fucking do it. And maybe even you were like, okay, I see another level of the game here that I hadn't maybe seen before when he's, that fucking dude came in and fucking, wow. Oh, man, you know, I, you know, I, it's crazy because it's almost like this thing Freddie Fox once said. He was like, yo, I've been in the studio for so many years. It's, uh, it's I don't really get impressed by MCs anymore. R right. And I'm not trying to be that guy. Like, no. I don't get impressed. But it's hard for me to think like who did, who went in like it's because it, I'm from like I said the old days so yeah. it's always a competition thing yeah. in my head so when somebody goes in there and murder it I'm, in my head I'm like oh, I'm gonna outdo them I'm gonna, it's, yeah. it's always like this weird competition thing so I can't think of who went in there and I was like oh shit so because I was like oh, I'm gonna get them whether I was right or wrong that's, yeah. that was always a mentality. That's the mentality so I'm trying to think I'm trying to think who I was like damn yo you know who who uh, I wasn't in the booth with him but I gave my rhyme to locksmith. And then he did a rhyme after my rhyme. I'm like, this motherfucker. You know, that, I remember that one, a kid named Locksmith from uh -huh. the Bay Area. Uh -huh. He always he always goes crazy. But um, you want a big name, right? But um, I don't know. Who just blew my mind? Who blew my mind? I, you know, I'm throwing a blank, man. I'm throwing a blank, you know? But, so, wait, the mentality of... If you name the MC on a record, I could tell you what I thought when he recorded it. Well, I, I mean, like, you. I mean, you're with Meth and Red... I mean, these are two of the great MCs of all time in my book. I yeah, love those two. Dave dudes. Rock and Rio, rest in peace. Uh, Long Island studio, Northport. Um, yeah, we were, we was coming up together, and uh, Red would be in the same spot recording with Eric all the time. In fact, I was recording at. So back. you knew Eric, Meth and Red. I knew Eric when I was a kid, like a little kid before the record deals. Not a little kid, but like Eric. fifteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. EPMD. Or, but oh, right, right, right. There right. was a studio, uh, Charlie Murata's studio. And that's where they recorded. That's where everybody went. That's where I was recording and all of them. But but uh, who was out at that? Yeah, EPMD and K Solo. Yeah, you know, that whole, that whole. Yeah. And, and then later on, Das and Red Redman yeah. and all of that stuff. And and so so I was in there. And Eric, yeah, I was probably 15, fifteen years old. And he, and you know I was known in the Long yeah. Island world. Sure. And sometimes they would. They would say, oh, we're going out to the city, and they'd put me on a street corner. I'd rap against some kids that they knew, like uh, stuff like that. That was the whole, because in that era, you had, if you were a rapper, you had to be a rapper, and you had to, did, did you have a battle? I was like, yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, you had to be ready to battle at any time. That was my era. Wait, so know? wait, wait, wait. So the mentality of I'm going to get him, right, which I, which I love that. I understand posse cut, right? So if, is this okay? You laid a verse, someone else came, and like, and it's, it's your record. And somebody else came and laid a verse. You're like, damn, can you redo your verse? I think that's okay. People have done that to me before a lot of times. But, but um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, because cause it's a new era. I think, if, I think it would be different if you were doing the uh, old days way where you were all in the studio together like in the yeah. 80s. And, and even in the 90s still before computer stuff, we'd all be in the studio together. And we'd all write our stuff or come with our written or whatever, and we'd all record the song. I think and, if somebody and, went back another time and read the verse, you'd be like, oh, we all did that song together. That but, would be considered whack because I, we were in the same room. You know what? Also, I think music is music as well. I think sometimes there's too many uh, what's what you're not allowed to do. We, we hold our own restrictions because, like, I know— But there's rules in this game. But I don't know if that's a rule. But I think that would have been weird if we all made the song together and someone came back later. But, but in the new, the new era where people are handing in verses— I think that happens often where you go, you know what? I'm going to step that verse up. I'll give you something new. You know, boom, boom, boom. You know? And when I did the the last album, uh, I don't know, a couple albums ago, uh, Master Ace, I changed the beat. I re the beat, I, 
it was one of the first songs I did on the album, and at the end I, I remixed it, and he was like, yo, like, I don't like the swing on my verse on that new beat, but I love the new beat. So I said, oh, shit, I, you know, I'll change it back then. You know, he's like, no, nah, but I like the beat. He's like, so let me go redo but that. But that's, 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 that's a different thing. You know you're, you're right, about. it's a different thing. But no, 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 if you think somebody outshined you and you said, you go, I'm going to go and it's change okay. shit. I think now it's ever, okay. I think in this ever it is. I, I, like I said, I don't think it's, you know, there's a whole thing with the ghostwriting thing that people go, oh, the, he can't be a goat if he ever got a ghostwriter. Because, what do you and, think about and, that? And they use that on Drake all the time. Like Drake, oh, my God. Because he had a ghostwriter. And Kanye had a ghostwriter. And this guy had a ghostwriter. But then they don't bring up, like, yo, in the 80s, they were about making records as well. So Roxanne Chante could battle anybody, beat you off the top of the head, destroy you. She was she was 13 destroying grown-ass men. And it, 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 there's documented yeah. recordings of that. Yeah, yeah. But then, you know... The studio time we're making a song now. So so Granddad IU might pick up the pen, or Kane or G Rap might pick up the pen, and nobody judged it. Biz Markey, like I said, one of my favorite artists of all time. Kane wrote some of his of wrote, wrote the vapors in the first half of, of the going off album. And um and a lot of people have, you know, a lot of especially West Coast, but a lot of people have Cube on their top five. But you know, Dell was writing some of his rhymes. Dell's so, a funky homo yeah, sapien. Yeah, supposedly, you know, I, I'm not in the studio, but that that I think that was no, known known. You know, so well. I mean, Jay Z's out here saying I wrote Snoop's verse on Still Dre. Yeah, Snoop was well, already and, a legend. And if you really want to go there, Dre, you know, had a million writers. But, and but nobody and considers Dre. I mean, let yeah, me go yeah, back. yeah, yeah. I know it, it's right. an interesting point that there was a period when there was a lot of ghost writing and nobody gave a shit. Yeah, and it, now it, suddenly. Cause, cause, but do you agree? Do you subscribe to that mindset that if you have a ghost writer, you can't be one of the great? MCs. No, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't, because it depends the era, you know, and this and that. I, I, I don't, I think that. You that, don't care who writes it. Yeah, because. It matters how you say it. You know what was fake in the day is if, if you was going to battle somebody or, or compete and be the best at the stage show, and then you came with somebody else's written rhyme. Well, that, that would be that weird. You write, that's garbage. But, but on a I, record. But, but the original thing was like, oh, we're in the studio. We're all making a song together. He's working on the bass. He's, he's doing this. You know, oh, oh, you got to rhyme. Like, the the craziest one to me is, you know Houdini, obviously, of right? Of course. So, so uh, um, Ecstasy has one of the greatest voices ever to me. Like, yeah. he's one of my favorite MCs ever. Not like, and, and Jalil is dope too, obviously. But Ecstasy, when he rhymed, it was like the golden voice for like, yeah. Yo, the record, yeah. it just transcended the record when his voice was on the record. Yeah. And then years later, Prince Paul was saying like, no, nah, Ecstasy, was, uh, um, Jalil was writing a lot of rhyme. I'm like, yo, but Jalil don't sound like Ecstasy. But that what it was. They were making a record together and, and e Ecstasy had some rhymes, Jalil had some rhymes. I mean, it would not be uncommon. I mean, I have seen all time elite MCs in the studio write something and somebody else says, why don't you say this instead of that? That happens all the time, too. Good, right. now, is that ghostwriting? No. That's helping. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, but, I, oh, but hold on. Let me go yeah, back a second. Because you said Drake can't be in an all-time argument because he has ghostwriters. You're no, I didn't holding say, that argument. No, I said that's what you, everyone— You're saying people they say that. Dis, that's the thing. And people not, say and that. No, you, were, you, were, you weren't taking that opinion I'm or not. I'm not a but, big Drake guy either. Well, that's what I'm saying. That even if— even if I don't care who authored Drake's records, yeah. there's no way that he's in the top that, 50 conversation. I agree with that. Okay, okay. But a lot, of, to me, a lot of people don't. You know? I, I know, and I get, it, 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 it. as you can hear, it triggers me. I get very upset about it. What's, my man, I'm like, what, what's the guy that runs Drake? Noah? Uh, he's like, he, he runs yeah. a label. And, and no ID be, or no whatever. No, uh, 080 or whatever. Shout yeah. out to this guy because... <laughs> You know, Drake jokes are funny to underground rappers. You make a Drake joke, your fans will be like, ah, Drake, you know, because he sings the love songs yeah. and this and that. So yeah, I'll throw some Drake jokes out here once in a while. And one time on my IG, I made a Drake joke. And the guy Noah, uh, what's his name, 80 or something. Okay. He's, you know, guy. it was like a week after they streamed a billion songs, billion in one week, you know. Yeah. And he inboxed me and was like, not confident. He was like, yo, dude, like. We looked up to you, man. Like I was, I'm like this huge fan, and this is kind of heartbreaking to me. Like you out there making, and I was like, dude, like you just streamed a billion fucking things. What the fuck did I do? Like, like, dude, I, anything I could say as a joke about Drake is not affecting Drake in any way. No, it's no. just us having fun. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. it's funny to us. Yeah, 
And but then he came at me. He's like, "You right? It ain't this, that." And he just stuck up for his man so hard. Like, but like not confrontation, just on sure. some love shit. And he made me feel like a child. But but not on like if he came at me like, "Yo, motherfucker, like, yo, suck my fuck, yeah, I'll fuck you," you know, like yeah. like. But he came at me where I'm like, "Yo, this that's like a mature adult," <laughs> and I'm like a little cunt being like, "Hey, Drake so joke." Much. So I, uh, I I messed him. I said, "Yo, you really uh, that was dope the way you you came at me." And I and and you know I can still make Drake jokes, but I don't feel like it. I, and that, now after he hit me like that, I was like, "Yo, that's a dope ass dude." You, you remind know? me, and I never I've never thought about this in a long ass time. This is like a very very long I'm time scared. ago. No no no, just 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 analogous to your story. I'm scared. And, and the way one man comes at another can be very powerful, of right? Of course, of course. And and it's a 30, 35 years ago, I was messing with this girl who lived with her man, mm -hmm. right? And then. One day I pick up the phone and it's him. Mm -hmm. And I had a vision this might happen. And I'm like, and I'm gonna be like, no, fuck you, motherfucker. Yeah, of course, of course. But he was on some yeah. very humble, yeah. nice, like, like I really do love her. And it's really kind of like fuck. And it was like, wow, well, you're coming at me like that. Exactly. I can't be like, ah, oh, fuck you. I'm like, Damn! Now you're pulling my heartstrings, and now you make me feel bad. Yeah, and you mean, small like, like I'm like, what yeah, I've been like doing. I'm a child for acting like that. Yes, you know, and getting yes. off the top of the, you know. And if he had come in hard, yeah. right, he would have got nothing. Yeah, but yeah, he came yeah. in sweet and vulnerable, yeah. and yeah. I was like, damn, I, I, I'm I'm sorry, dog. What's the famous saying? Like sugar and vinegar. Mm. Some, some sugar gets you. Boo, or something. <laughs> I forgot what the saying is, but you know what I'm trying to say. But yeah. but but to pull back two things. To me, the the number one thing I want from an MC is great flows, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Even more than the lyrics, because you could say nothing mm -hmm. and make it sound incredible with great flows. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time, Drake is not even flowing at all, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. His relationship yeah. to the beat quite often is fairly chaotic. Dra Drake had a run where, like, uh, his radio records, like, there was a time, like, most of the rap on the radio, I was really... I really disliked it. And yeah. I, it wasn't me hating it. It was just, come on, this is so dumbed down. And when Drake would come on, there'd be a Drake song on, and he would try at least to put a unique spin on the way he said things. Yeah. And I'm not saying, oh, so you're not, I'm not putting him up there with like no, these no, no. guys. But so when he it came on as a radio record, I said, you know what? I don't mind listening to what he's trying to say on this particular radio record at this time, but I would never bump it at my house or tell right. people, like, listen to this to study the way to rhyme. But... I, res I understood it, why other people, you know, so certain stuff blows up and I don't understand. I'm just like, how <laughs> the hell is this even possible? <laughs> like, I, I but you know what it is? You know what's possible? That you are hip hop mm -hmm. and the people blowing up said record are not, even no, no, though no, it's no, a hip hop that's, record. That's, that's always the so case. So that's why yeah. you're like, I don't understand that. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. we don't understand the people who are getting behind that yeah, record. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's any art. That sure. becomes, you know, a hundred billion dollar industry. You know, they're going to market it to people who aren't part of it. You yeah. know, so that that is what that is. You know, yeah. and it's like, look at movies. Everything's a, a Marvel movie because that's generating the movie and, yeah. and generating the money. And you know. wait, so all right, so we struggled to get a top five MC. Yeah, I don't. List. Ha I really, you know but what? No, I, I have, understand because you're have a different you're, one. You know, all the time I change up. Wait, you know, so. lyricism top five? Oh, lyrical top five. I hate top five lists so much, <laughs> but uh, 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 I think Rock Kim with the with the groundbreaking, absolutely uh, uh, game changing because it was like you know I said you could do a documentary before and after like almost like 100%. A, a, you know 100%. BC and AD. in terms of internal rhymes, yeah, yeah, in terms of polysyllabic rhymes, yeah, 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 yeah. in terms of the philosophical uh, stuff that is going on, I start to think and then I sink into the paper like yeah, I was yeah, ink. Yeah, yeah. Nobody was doing that yeah, and yeah. it became much more part of the culture after him. But he's he is the beginning of the modern style of MCing. Yep, yep. And, and you know, I don't like doing top fives because it always go back to my era. Sure. But like, you know, Lupe, when Lupe Fiasco first dropped, he come from the newer school where your voice could be kind of thinner and be like, you know, th you know this sure. kind of thing. So my first uh, time listening to Lupe, I kind of didn't get it. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm like, it's not for me. It's kind of, yeah. it's like, I like, I like bass, how low can you go? <laughs> you know, yeah, I like yeah, the voices. Yeah. And then uh, sometimes you gotta go give, you know, 
people like there's people who have Lupe like the Rock Kim of their era of you know you know and I know you're not there but there, people from a certain age group have Lupe like there. Well, so I uh, I took time to say let me listen to to the guy and I started studying some of his bars and the way he said certain things and and it's it's really intellectual rap sometimes so so. I'm not saying he's a top five for me, but he's a guy who who I got into later, where okay. I was late to the party on, okay. you know? And there's a lot of guys like that, like El Zai from Slum Village. Like, you know, I'm not saying he's a, my top five all time, but El Zai, like, I like guys that scare me. Like when, when I hear scare rhyme from them, way. like, I'm like, damn, I wish I wrote that shit or that bar or the way he said that was so fucking slick. You who know? else does that for you? There, there's a lot of them. Like, like and... and Nas is a lot of people's top five, and he's not my top five. Okay, but we, we you know, there's songs. Uh, you know the song "Poison" from Nas. Uh, Salam Remy did it. I, I don't even know if that's the title of the song, but he's like, "This is poison." It's it's play it when you get home, and it's like one of the most perfect rap songs I ever heard. And when it when he's spitting his bars, I'm sitting there like, "Woo, woo!" I'm getting excited. I'm getting that feeling of hip hop. Okay. And I think it, I think it's called What Comes Around. I think that's what it's called, something like that. But the hook is poison, poison. You know, uh, okay. not not the G rap or Bell Bill DeVoe poison, but of course. poison, you know, uh religion and it, and it just felt like everything that's perfect in a hip hop record. Okay. And so so uh that when I hear that, I'm envious of it. I'm like, wow, this record is just so fucking perfect. You know, so those are the kind of records I like. When I hear a record that everyone's going crazy about, which They'll kill me for this. But a lot of times when I hear Kendrick Lamar verses that people are really going crazy over, it doesn't give me that feeling of fright or like, wow, I wish I wrote that. This is the most ridiculously really? insane lyric I ever heard. I don't get that from a lot of Kendrick. Once in a while I go, oh, yo, all right, all right. Because I think Kendrick is the most like the MCs that we idolized from the past, I'm out of today. I'm not sure about that because like I said, I'm a voice and delivery guy with, with and he does a lot of those thinny, thin voices, and we're not, we're not, you know, yeah. which is not really what I'm into. The but, higher pitched voices, you're not, it's yeah, not for you. So, so, such so a, wait, so, so. Like like we were saying, Brother J, Q -tip? Brother Joy voice. Yeah, Q-Tip has a beautiful, amazing voice. But he's know? a little higher. No, nah, but he, had, he uh, he's not bassy, but he he had, he's not like, a, he doesn't have he, that. Uh, he's not reedy. This, the squeak kind of thing. Okay. I don't want to say nobody squeak, but you know what I mean. You know? No, I, I think I know so, what you but mean. But like, I'll, so he... I'll take a Q-tip voice over a Jay-Z voice, even though I think Jay-Z's a better rapper. You know, really? you know what I mean? And, and well, I like Jay-Z well, better as a whole MC, I, MC. Yeah, yes, Q-tip has I, one of the great voices, voices of all time. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Which is really strong. And, and if you want to go back to your old argument, Snoop has one of the greatest voices oh, of all absolutely. time. Absolutely. So I forgot who I was telling you I like better than Snoop. But you could always go, but does that motherfucker have the voice of Snoop? Because when Snoop talks right on the mic, it, it just sound like, it sound like that. And part you know? of what so, is so important to me about Snoop is you can hear the South, the Southern twang, yep, yep. right? Because his people are from Mississippi and wow. then moved to yep, Cali. Yep, yep. And I think you can hear, so I'm like, yo, I can hear like the great migration in your voice. Yeah, Cause yeah. you're clearly LA or or Long Beach or Southern Cali, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I can hear the Southern twang the in there. So it's, it's deep. It's yeah. deep. He's well, deep. Well, let me get on some movie nerd stuff because you were talking Come movie on. stuff. But one of my <laughs> favorite Snoop moments, which like three viewers will know what I'm talking about. But uh, no, nah, no, nah, don't know this. There was a director called Jama Fanaka. You familiar with him? Uh -uh. He, you know, he's a black filmmaker from the '70s, and he's one of one. Of, he's he should be on iconic levels. Okay, because he was broke kid from, I don't know if it was Compton or where it was, one of, one of the, he was from Mississippi originally, moved to LA and he, he went to film school and they had all the cameras there. You know, this is before you get cameras or equipment in the seventies, you know, and he made three films in film school with the cameras and, and, and he made uh, uh, Emma May, Welcome Home Brother Charles, and then he made Penitentiary, all in film school with his, with the cameras from the film school, black filmmaker. And uh, Penitentiary ended up being the largest grossing independent film of, I think, 79 or 80. And it made $11 million from his film in film school. Holy shit. So, uh, uh, Jama's iconic. But, okay, this is off subject. But Snoop, somehow Snoop, I, I ended up tracking down Jama because I'm a movie psycho. So, <laughs> before he passed away, I'm, I, Jama, Jama, I found him, you know. 
But uh, I found a clip of Snoop with Jama, and Jama, uh, Snoop knew all the lyrics. He knew every song from all the movies, and, and Jama's like an old Mississippi boy moved to Cali. And I don't know, I guess you said the old uh, South and shit, and, and I thought, it, I just want to shout out Jama Fanak and Snoop recognizing Jama Fanaka's film. Kane has one of the great voices of all time. Kane has a really great voice. And, and crisp and sharp and and and, and the right depth there. and yep, the yep. there's there's like richness in yep. the depth. Rakim. Yep, yep. Yeah, well, Rakim's voice, in particular, you'll remember, anything Rakim said was a sample. You could sample yeah. you everything just, he said sounded deep because of the voice. And not, yeah, and and but you could just this is how it should be done. Whatever it was, pump yes. up the volume. He could say yes. any phrase, and it's a hit record or, yes. or a hit hip hop record. You yes. know? Because so it sounded better than see, any way you could say this And shit. this is something, you know, I was talking to Primo uh, uh, years back, and he said this, and I was like, yeah, you're right. He was saying, yeah, you know, when, because I had the young kid Afro, and he could do all these fast flows, and and Premier said, you know, those fast flows sound good, they're great, technical shit is great, but as a DJ standpoint, I like the moment that you hear somebody says something, and you could... That's a chorus. That's a boom, boom. But you know, so that's how I when I make records, I think as a DJ standpoint, what would I sample? What would I cut? What would I do this? And I was like, wow, that's so dope. So, so, so when you talk about Rakim, that that he was the ultimate of every single word he said could be cut. Everything, everything out of his mouth could be cut. And that's another thing, like with Chuck D. But you know, everything out of Chuck's mouth is cut, scratch, screw, boom, boom, boom. So it's all where, where like if you take like somebody like a Buster technically on stage and, and technical, but but who got the more quotable things, Buster or Rakim, you know, and it's Rakim sure. all, the, all sure. day, you know, everything sure. sound like a record out of Rakim's mouth. Sure, hell yeah. Um, how do you practice? Uh, performing or, or? Rapping. Writing or, or rapping? I mean, rapping, I mean, emceeing as far as what you might do what you're gonna do in a That's studio a or in the studio show in this in a studio oh studio is just right 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 but that's not practicing that's creating yeah but what what happens is it's a new era too so back in the day you you used to have to make sure your rhyme was perfected because yeah. you didn't have access to studios when you were in the studio right. you were paying and right. you, you weren't going back to fix it right and and, it, and you didn't have all these technologies to like ah eh, change this part of the verse to this part of it you know you know so so uh, you just had to memorize your verse, wrap it in the mirror, be confident, go crazy, and then go in the studio, go in that booth, one, two, two, whatever the fuck it is, you know? Now, a lot of times I'll go with a book of rhymes to a, a song concept, and I'll, I'll spit 16 of these and go, you know, let me try these 16. And I'll go, you know what? The first eight sound good from that, the second okay. eight of that sound good. And, and, so writing a lot to help you get to the best stuff. Yeah, I, well, like, yeah. There, there's different ways to do stuff. Certain MCs, if they don't have, if they, they're not feeling it, they they won't write. They wait till they feel it, you know. And, and that's a cool way to do it. And they come up with great stuff. Me, even if I'm not feeling it, yeah, I almost do it like exercising. Like fuck it, you know. Even if you write something terrible today, you're writing. And, and I'll get there. I'm like, this is this is not up so to you. So you want to write something every day. It, it, well, when I'm on tour, I can't. But when when I'm off tour, yeah, and and you know, okay, the kids are at kindergarten. I got I got six hours. You better write something fantastic. You know, oh, the kids are sleeping. You better lock yourself in the bathroom when no one hear you and write something fantastic. So I got to write a verse every day. Yeah, it, when, when I have downtime to work on, you know, you know, when I'm not touring, that's yeah, every single day. So I don't time. use all that stuff. Yeah, but yeah. the act of creating helps yeah. me. And then say you have two, three whack days in a row. Where you're like, God damn. Then the fourth day, you're like, wait, this isn't good yet, but that idea is crazy. And then you go, oh, shit, and then the flood comes. Sure. <laughs> you know, you're, oh, shit, four, boom, boom. And, and all of a sudden, you wrote like a whole month worth in one day. So all the days you wasted writing stuff that wasn't it. So that's how I work. That's but then you get, do you have to... Do you have to do something to your mouth and your throat the way an athlete has to like stretch well, the body? Well, they make fun of me for that. That's funny you ask me that because I do. I do all the do, I have, vocal exercises. I do the and and like what else? And I do all of this. You really? Want yeah. <laughs> but yeah, up and down, and then because what happened in the 90s late 90s, I got I got a deal after the black ball. All this shit was crazy. It took me five years to finally 
let motherfuckers know, okay, I'm not dangerous like they say. I, you can, you can fuck with me. And then I lost my. I did some shows in Europe and I got polyps and I had blood on my vocal cords and all of this oh, shit. shit. And I wasn't getting better for months and months. And the label thought I'm keeping their money and this and that. And I'm like, and then uh, after nine months, somebody said this woman, Dr. Gwen Corvin, she's the best in the world. And I'm not a type to owe names and this and that. But she, every vocal singer that you could name goes to her because they call her the magician physician, you know? Okay. Because she fixes you from Broadway singers to actors to the greatest singers on the planet. And, and uh, so they say, you should go to her. And I said, yo, and it's, it's expensive, but, you know, she's going to fix you. And she, she did. She, 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 she put me on the right diet. She, she, she put me on everything. She just cleaned my whole shit up. She put me to a tenor, a guy that's uh, like a, a opera singer. And he had me there, ooh, doing all this funny shit. But what happens is, you see, when we're talking, I'm talking with the bass side of my voice. So if all you're doing is lifting this part of your arm, you're going to have a big arm and everything's going to be easily broken and weak, right? So you have to you got, you have to exercise the whole vocal cord. If you're going to do 45 shows, I mean, maybe other people don't, but I do. Uh, if you're going to do 45 shows in a row every night, you have to make the, the high part of your voice strong. You have to exercise the whole thing, not just the thing that you talk about, talk with every day of your life. You know, so that's how that comes in and it, and it makes it strong. And then since I started going to her, uh, and this was in the late 90s, I was able to, there was years I was doing 180 shows a year. Wow. Like I would just be on the road every single night, boom, wow. boom. You know, I wasn't even putting out records. I was just performing. I was What's performing. your number one income stream? Shows. Shows. Yeah. So when COVID hit. It, shows, number one. What's number two? Um, Merchandise. Shows again, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, Which, no, that, or, or but that's that's a, to me that's in the umbrella of yeah, yep, yep, performance because yep. it really only happens when yep. you perform. Yep. yep well, what's yep. number three? Three is you know when when you make a record, you know you put it out there and and you know you get sales off of that. You know, so. S- buying the album, but but streaming has killed that. Stream well, the, the streaming and all that stuff adds up, and 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 that leads to shows. So it does. You know what I mean, so the guys are talking about the album as basically a lost leader to get to shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that how it is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I forgot what it was now, but yeah, it is what it is. We talked about a lot. I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, last thing to ask everybody. What is your superpower? What is the thing you do better than other people that has led to the success you've had? Well, I, I was, I don't want to say I was born, but that, it was a natural ability for some reason. So I don't know if it's a super power, but it's the only thing I'm good at. You know, everything else I'm a fucking mess. Like I can't even go to the supermarket and function out like everything. Everyone's like, how do you do that? You can't do anything in the world. So so I think that if, if I have any superpowers to rat, you know, that was something since I was a kid, I just got I just out better than everyone around me for so long. And I don't know why. I don't know why, but that's what it was, you know. So I can just rap. I'm a rapping motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. is what I got. Yeah. And there was no reason for me to be be that what happened you know? amen thanks so much to ra for a great interview and thanks to you for listening Torre show gives you fuel to power your dreams because you can use your dreams like a rocket ship to blast you into a life you never imagined you can make your dreams a reality and maybe this show can help you can find me on instagram at Torre show Torre Show is written by me, Torre, and produced by Jennifer Brown. Our editor is Ryan Woodhall. Our booker is Claudia Jean. And we're distributed by DCP Entertainment. And we will be back on Wednesday with more amazing guests because the man can't shut us down.